what has happened in this country is that many of the problems which we have created ourselves without any assistance from anyone have been blamed on China. The problems that we have are overwhelmingly 90 plus percent here our fault. I think people listen to President Xi because I thought he spoke with great clarity. We have to understand that Taiwan and China are part of the same nation. Hong Kong always was. Most Chinese here in Hong Kong don't support any of this nonsense. They're not upset or uncomfortable with the, the mainland. Yep. They don't buy into all of this. Uh, we're going to be an independent democratic state and the British and Americans are going to come to our rescue. They think it's nonsense. No one in Asia wants a war. And my argument now for years has been we need to demilitarize our relationship with Asia. Hmm. We need to do business and get the forces out. This is Colonel Douglas McGregor, a 28-year veteran of the U.S. Army who previously served as the senior advisor to the U.S. Secretary of Defense. I've had the colonel on the show to discuss complex issues like the war in Ukraine and the battle between Israel and Hamas. But I wanted to invite him to speak about an issue that many feel is the greatest threat to the future of America, and that of course, is China. The United States' relationship with China is fascinating. On one hand, U.S. media preaches every day that China is a giant threat and America's largest adversary. But on the other hand, the United States and China enjoy a robust trade relationship worth over $700 billion annually. There is no better example of just how important China is to the future of America's economy than last month when Chinese President Xi Jinping came to San Francisco and personally met with Joe Biden. His message was one of peace and wanting to find a way for the U.S. and China to get along. Some of America's most prominent businessmen, knew the importance of Xi's visit and paid $40,000 a plate to sit at the Chinese president's table during a banquet dinner for American executives. These executives aren't stupid. They know their companies rely on China, and in fact, the entire U.S. economy would crumble without trade from China. In today's interview, I asked the colonel his insights into the fentanyl crisis and if China is really to blame for America's drug epidemic. We discussed the biggest questions surrounding the future of U.S.-China relations, which of course is Taiwan. Finally, we discussed the best strategy for the U.S. in the Asia-Pacific region and how the U.S. and China can avoid a future war. Today's interview is a fascinating insight into all things China. But before we begin, I have to address something that many of you have seen in my recent videos. Many of you have started to notice that I've had a significant change in my appearance. For years, I've been struggling with hair loss, but now I have a full set of hair. Many of you know that I recently traveled to Istanbul, Turkey. But now it's time to tell everybody the main purpose behind this, and that was getting a full hair transplant. Turkey is the leading destination for this type of procedure, and Dr. Sinek is the top doctor in Istanbul offering this service. This is what I look like before the surgery, and here I am just two weeks later. Now, the full results of this surgery won't come in for a few more months, so I'm excited to track the progress and see my new hair growth every week here on YouTube. Thank you to Dr. Sinek for this amazing sponsorship and support, and now let's jump into today's interview. How do you see the future with China? First of all, Historically, over the last 50, 60 years, I think Americans on balance have a positive view of Chinese, Chinese civilization, Chinese culture, Chinese people. In other words, there is no built-in hostility to China. What has happened in this country is that many of the problems which we have created ourselves without any assistance from anyone have been blamed on China. You know, the favorite topic is fentanyl. Right. Look at all the fentanyl that's killing 100,000 American citizens every year. The Chinese are doing that. They're trying to destroy us. You turn around to them and say, well, first of all, there are 1.4 billion Chinese. Every morning, President Xi wakes up and he thinks about that. Yeah. He's got 1.4 billion Chinese that, that for which he is responsible that's right. Well, he is responsible. He is not thinking about how to destroy us. That's a lot of nonsense. Agreed. Uh, but he's also got a corruption problem. He's got an organized crime problem. In some ways, it's as large, probably dwarfs ours in many respects. We fail to recognize that if we don't like the fentanyl coming into the United States, well, secure our ports, secure our borders. Correct. If we don't like the people carrying it, stop the people from bringing it in. That's right. Can that be done? Of course it could be done. And why have we got 
tens of thousands of troops sitting in Europe or the Middle East somewhere, or right now on the Korean Peninsula, they have no real mission there whatsoever. Right. They're not deterring North Korea. North Korea has its own problems. It's not going to attack anybody. Yeah. If it did, the Chinese would hammer them into the ground hmm. <clears throat> because no one in Asia wants a war. Yeah. So why not bring those forces back to the United States, put them on the border and protect the country? Maybe. Why not commit more naval power to our literal waters? Yeah. If we want to do these things, we can do those things. That's right. But Americans have not thought in those terms. Instead, they've been handed a scapegoat for the problems that they have here at home because nobody in Washington wants to stand up and say, well, I've opened the borders, you know, because it's in my personal interest financially to do so. Uh, right. Because I have interest in industries. I have interest in the Chamber of Commerce. People are paying me. So, you know, I'm sorry, but I can't secure your borders. Right. I mean, stop and think about that. There would be thousands, 100,000 Americans with torches and, and pitchforks in uh, Washington streets finding congressmen and senators to hang. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm shipping more jobs out of the country because uh, cheaper labor is better for profits. And I'm ultimately about profits, not labor not the interests of working people, not the American people. Nobody's going to admit that. Right. But that's the problem. The problems that we have are overwhelmingly 90 plus percent here our fault. Absolutely. And we've got to deal with it. Yeah. And the only two people that are willing to say that at all, uh, to some extent, Donald Trump, although I think he continues to beat the anti-Chinese drum unnecessarily, and uh, RFK Jr. Right. And uh, we got to stop talking about this vast Chinese military state that's on the march to conquer Asia. You know, the Asians have something to say about that. Mm -hmm. And the Asians used to live in a Sinocentric universe for a couple of thousand years. They don't want to go back to that. Mm -hmm. Least of all the Japanese. Right. And the Japanese and the Chinese know each other very well. You know, when Kissinger went to uh, set up the meetings that, that were subsequently held with Nixon and then, of course, set those up and he went to China with Nixon for the opening of relations with the Chinese. I think it was Deng Xiaoping who said to Kissinger through an interpreter, have you discussed any of this with Tokyo? Of course, typical American answer was no. Yeah. And he said, you know, not. you really should. You should fly to Tokyo and tell them what has happened here and explain it. Hmm. Well, no kidding. Good Lord. How right. could you miss that? We, we're fools. We don't understand the world we live in. We don't understand diplomacy or strategic relationships. You know, we've taken this ridiculous position. You're either with us or against us. We're good. Everyone else who is not with us is bad. Correct. It's, it's a, a dead end. We are headed down the dead end street. And I think Americans, if you sit them down and talk to them, they won't disagree with you. Yeah. They're not represented in Washington. That's right. No. And that's what most Americans are beginning to figure out. The people in Washington are there for themselves, not for the people that they're supposed to care for. Our government has an obligation to secure us, protect us, help us find shelter, and help us feed ourselves. Correct. That's it. They're not doing it. They haven't done it for a long time. That's right. Well, I mean, interesting you bring up the fentanyl because 90% uh, of the fentanyl that enters into the United States is through the Mexican border. So, you know, it's going right to the drug cartels in Mexico, and it's a huge issue, you know, securing that, that bottom border. And I, I totally agree with your sentiment that we have, you know, 800 military bases around the world. Why are we not using our grand military to secure that border down south? I think it's an absolute necessity. How do you look at the future, though, uh, as far as with, with China, kind of going back to that uh, Taiwan issue? Uh, you know, because I think right now we're, we're at a very pivotal point. You know, for example, in 2024, we're going to see a presidential election in Taiwan. It looks like there's going to be a joint ticket that potentially could put in a little bit more of a pro-Beijing uh, government in Taiwan, although that's not confirmed. And it might be uh, you know, an election where we have uh, a president that is much more independent if the DDP does win than you know, kind of going down that road of you know, going towards independence. We certainly see some 
U.S. politicians really saying now is a time to get away from strategic ambiguity and to go to strategic clarity and declare Taiwan independent, which, interesting enough, does go against the will of the majority of Taiwanese. I mean, so many people are saying, look, China's going to invade. China's going to invade at, you know, by 2025, 2027, 2030. We hear all these estimations from the U.S. government on when China's going to invade. Are we just setting ourselves up for the next proxy war? You know, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, normally I, I might say yes, but I got to go back to the financial realities and constraints that are operating. So I don't think that's possible. Okay. I also think that the uh, uh, deplorable performance in Ukraine of many Western military systems after extensive training and equipment of the Ukrainian military has uh, been sobering for many people in the West. And then finally, I think there is a growing awareness that the world has changed, that now you can't sit with impunity offshore in a great fleet and hurl bombs and rockets at your enemy without any retribution. Right. So no, I think there's more there's more common sense there than uh, meets the eye, and I think that Biden and his administration, in their own feeble way, recognizes that and tried to su to some extent to to make that clear. Unfortunately, they are products of this uh, sort of self destructive delusional ideology of uh, liberal democracy and crusades to establish it. I hope, I think, people listen to President Xi because I thought he spoke with great clarity. We have to understand that Taiwan and China are part of the same nation. Yeah, Hong yeah Kong, absolutely. Hong Kong always was. Yeah. And, you know, I remember when we were watching on television what was happening in Hong Kong and my oldest son happened to be over there for several months on business. And he kept telling me, he said, you know, the most Chinese here in Hong Kong don't support any of this nonsense. They're not upset or uncomfortable with the, the mainland. Yep. They don't buy into all of this. Uh, we're going to be an independent democratic state and the British and Americans are going to come to our rescue. They think it's nonsense. Absolutely. And, you know, Xi, I think, was very smart in the way he handled things. If he was the, the terrible figure and, and national leader that he's depicted as being in the United States, he could have summoned up any number of forces and marched into Hong Kong and beat everybody into submission. He Absolutely. didn't do that. He didn't want to do that. He's not interested in that. Correct. He's not interested in beating the Vietnamese into submission. He certainly doesn't want to renew that relationship with Japan on those terms. That's insane. Correct. No one in Asia wants a war. And my argument now for years has been we need to demilitarize our relationship with Asia. We need to do business and get the forces out. Yeah. But <clears throat> I'm viewed as, you know, where he's a reactionary, he's an isolationist. We've never been an isolationist country. We usually, mostly, almost all the time, did business with everyone. That's right. Otherwise, we couldn't have gotten as rich and powerful as we did. So, you know, the short answer is I think we will avoid the war with China. But, you know, I could be wrong. I, I was shocked at the stupidity and foolishness in Washington when finally President Putin discovered that he had no choice. He had to demonstrate the seriousness of the situation. Then he was shocked that we paid no attention to that. Right. And he had to fight on there for almost two years. I think that sunk into some people's brains. But again, this is not so much a question of the population of the country, because if you put that on the ballot referendum, do you support war with China, Russia, whatever? Right. I think you'd get it overwhelmingly. No, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. But we don't run those referenda. Right. Great insights. Colonel, I want to thank you so much. I'll give you the final word. Tell us a little bit more about Our Country, Our Choice. Well, Our Country, Our Choice is about a number of things. First of all, we wanted to unite Americans across party lines. We're tired of the divisiveness. We're also tired of being ruled by what is effectively a uniparty. You know, Democrats and Republicans, there aren't much differences. And as many people tell me over and over again, you know, I voted this way, I voted that way, I got the same outcome. Yeah. We want to, we want to put it into that. And then we're tired of the wars. We want to see the restoration of justice and an end to the criminality. We want the borders controlled. All of these things that most Americans can agree on. And that's, that's where right. we want to focus. We don't want the sexualization of children. We want that to stop in our schools. Amen. Everybody can agree to that with very few exceptions. And we're, we're going to try and also be a media platform. We're building that capability. And we want to want to stream what we call fact-based information fantastic so that our members will have have the information that is simply information 
yeah. not opinion based, not interpreted for them, but provides them with the best possible truthful data that we can provide, knowing full well that that's tough. You know, it's harder now than ever, but we want to try it. Fantastic. Well, that's a great mission that I can certainly get beyond, um, you know, uh, get, get behind rather. And uh, Colonel, I want to thank you so much for your time. You're a true American American patriot. I thank you so much for your, you know, uh, service to the country, but also your vision and your willingness to come on the show and really speak your mind about this and not being afraid to really call it out exactly what this country needs and what this leadership needs. And let's hope that we get some uh, better direction in 2024. So we're going to put uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor, we're going to put his website also, his uh, YouTube channel as well. We're going to put that down in the description down below. Colonel, thank you again for all your time today. Sure. My best to you too. Thank you. All right. Pleasure. Everyone, thank you for watching today's interview with Colonel McGregor, and I hope you enjoyed his insights into China. If you haven't watched our interviews on both Ukraine and Israel, these are also fantastic interviews that you simply can't miss. Simply click here and here to watch those full presentations. Once again, thank you to my new partner, Dr. Sinek, the number one hair transplant clinic in Turkey. If you are interested in learning more about improving your hair, please check out the link to Dr. Sinek in the description below. Thank you all for your continued support. And I look forward to seeing you all in our next video soon.